There can be few more terrifying things than stepping out onto a grand stage for a dance competition, gazing out into a full theatre audience and seeing the director of a leading ballet company lit up, pen in hand, ready to judge you. That's what happened to the finalists in the Royal Academy of Dance's flagship event, the Margot Fontaine International Ballet Competition. It took place in London recently at His Majesty's Theatre and the judges were beloved ballerina Darcy Bussell, Amanda Britton, who heads the Rombert School, and Aaron S. Watkin, who is the new artistic director of English National Ballet and our guest today on Why Dance Matters, the RAD podcast. Aaron and his fellow judges were sitting, glowing, at the front of the Royal Circle. Today, I'm meeting him up close at the English National Ballet's smart headquarters in London's Docklands. And I'm hoping Aaron won't be quite as scary. His record could be intimidating. He trained in Canada, danced with leading international companies, notably William Forsyth's Ballet Frankfurt, and was nabbed to lead the Semper Opera Ballet in Dresden, transforming it from a trad classical outfit to a modern, wide-reaching company. 17 years on, he's come to London, returning to English National Ballet, with whom he danced for a while, but is now leading and hoping to put his stamp on the company. Aaron sounds like someone who knows what he likes, what he wants, perfect director material, perhaps, and judge material too. Let's head to his office and hear more. Aaron, it's such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for being on Why Dance Matters. And I saw you from a distance just the other day at the Margot Fontaine International Ballet Competition, where you were one of the judges. And it wasn't just me seeing you, it was all those young dancers on stage who will have gone to the very swanky His Majesty's Theatre, onto that gorgeous stage, looked out, and there you and your fellow judges were, lit up at the front of the dress circle, little notepads in hand, ready to assess. That must have been terrifying for them. How was it for you? I'm someone, actually, I never participated in competitions as a young dancer in my school we weren't actually allowed to but I have then since as a director judged a lot of different competitions and you always have to take into mind you know the kind of anxiety and stress that goes along with presenting yourself in front of so many people I think it is character building I think it's a great process to go through and what of the come aways from the children there when I spoke to them afterwards was what a wonderful welcoming environment they felt they were in. So even though it was a competition and they are competing, they were supporting each other. And one boy in particular said he'd never felt that before in a competition. So I thought that was quite nice. And unlike a professional audition where you might already have a sense of who the dancers you're seeing are, For these young dancers, presumably they were all new to you. And so you're making an instant judgment. Do you immediately get a sense of a dancer's stage personality when they step on stage? I think the way that this competition was structured over three days and then the final day where the finalists had to perform again their variations... You have always certain artists that come up on the first showing very positively, everything's working, and other ones that might have had a slower start. But then seeing them over a longer period, some stay kind of the same and some really excel. So that's quite interesting. I think it is difficult if you're literally judging one performance from a competition because that's really how that person's feeling mentally, physically, how they put it all together. But when you have the opportunity, like in the Margot Fontaine competition, to see them over four days, you can get a much better perspective. There is technique which can be beautiful and precise and refined. But there's also charisma, I guess. There's, there's also presence. There's also communicating that technique to an audience. 
do you find that not just among young dancers, that dancers as a whole, there are people for whom that comes naturally and other people who really have to work at sharing their gift with an audience? Yeah, I think it really, you know, we're all such individual people. Some are more brain-oriented, thinking first of all the steps and working them out. Others are quite intuitive and approaching it, as you say, more with a reason of why they're doing the intention that's at the forefront. With young students, it's hard because they're in training and they're being trained by their teachers. So they're being told everything. But one of the three categories we were judging, one was technique, one was performance, and one was musicality. So inside that performance aspect, Artistry is a big part of that. So when I'm watching a dancer, I'm, of course, looking to see that the technique is all where it should be. But more importantly, I'm looking to see what that young dancer has to say. Because I think as an audience, that's the first thing that the public's going to relate to is why they're attracted to that specific person on stage. It's what qualities they're bringing, who they are, actually. Yeah, and I think that's important, very important. And the gold medal at the Fontaine went to a very young dancer, really, only 16, Jacob Weiwei Hughes, who had, for me, that thing that communicates a real sense of dash, but also a vulnerability. It was a really arresting combination. What was it about him that impressed you and and your fellow judges? I think just that. It's that obviously technically was very accomplished and also considering his age because he's quite young very natural but he had from the moment he came out a very special feel about him this sort of as you say in a way I don't want to say flashy or overly extrovert it's almost this sort of sensibility about him the sensitivity about him you could feel his artistry coming through as impactful as his technique so he had a nice mix between both you couldn't fault him really on the technical aspect but then he had so much to bring to personality and and special quality that i think we all felt and did the evening take you back to the 16 year old Aaron what were you like at that point my journey was quite different I only started professional ballet training at the age of 12 so when I was 16 I was very much into just figuring it all out I had started late so I was really training and trying to understand what ballet was all about and how I could be the best that I could be. But I think you you just have to really imagine like we didn't know the ages and we didn't know the names of any of the dancers while we were judging them. And then after when I looked at the program, all of us, we were quite surprised at how young the gold medalist was. And when you take that into consideration, you think, wow, what a maturity he already has at such a young age. But you, though you say you started late, I think you also left home to train quite early. I mean, it does force you to grow up that kind of training. How did you know, not having been doing ballet classes since the age of four or whatever, how did you know that it was the right thing for you at that age? Mine is kind of interesting because I started in a local school with tap dancing. My sister was doing tap and and I really liked the sounds and the rhythms and I was very attracted and I feel like musicality was something that came quite natural to me and I loved that aspect and my teacher over some years was saying you should really try some ballet to help with your upper body and your presence and then my sister saw an audition for the National Ballet School a poster and I just kind of tagged along I didn't have any ballet training I remember they were looking at me and going oh look his feet and his physique is quite I guess it was at that time I didn't understand what having nice feet meant but I just got into it I was kind of thrown into it it was five hours away on a plane I mean this is Canada so it's a long way away from my home And for the first two years, I wouldn't say I was enjoying it, but I felt like this was something special. And my mom really wanted me to stick it out to really understand first what it was. Every time I'd come home, I would be very upset and I wouldn't want to go back. And it was quite hard for her, I think. And then it happened 
two years after that I was really upset. And I said, I absolutely don't want to go. And she said, go one more time. And at Christmas, if you really don't want to stay, you can leave. And I'm really grateful to my mom because it must be so hard to see your child leaving like that. And in those four months, I completely switched and I understood and I was so engaged and so excited. And then I've been on this amazing journey and I just kept thinking to myself, wow, if I'd just given up, you know, where would I be today? Wow. And what was it that changed? Was it a particular teacher? Was it just you were that bit older and more grown up? I think it was me. I think I got past, I was very wrapped up in missing my family that I wasn't really invested in what was going on in front of me. And I think it's just a maturity. I just realized, wow, look what all my colleagues are doing where they're going in the world all the opportunities they have to dance with these wonderful companies and I started to understand ballet more and I started to enjoy ballet in a different way so I think it it just clicked it's your light bulb moment like lots of kids have I was 14 when I finally sort of figured it out for myself You went on to be awarded a Most Promising Student Award, which is, you know, I feel you've delivered on as we sit in the Artistic Director's Office at English National Ballet. (laughs) Good tick for whoever spotted that potential. And you had an amazing career. You danced in Canada, you danced here at English National Ballet, in Spain, in Germany. I've read that you felt all along that dancing wasn't the end of that journey, that there was something else you really should be doing. Can you explain what that felt like? So from very young, I mean, I enjoyed dancing, but I would say in those days, this is another subject, but with classical ballet, I had a lot of anxiety because I felt like my expectations were really high and I never felt like it was good enough. So if I managed to do a good performance and came off stage, I, in retrospect, I'd say, okay, that was good. But I wasn't able to enjoy myself on stage until when I was doing flamenco in school or when I met William Forsyth and I moved into his company. That style felt very natural to me. So I actually did enjoy it. I always felt from very young that my calling was... I was always interested in teaching. I was always interested in organizing. Even when I was 14 in school, my friend and I just taught all of Paquita to the school on our free time. And we did a a showing for our teachers and, you know, just doing the casting. I also like the administrative side and also artistic planning and organization. So I just felt like, I know this maybe, I don't say this in the wrong way, but that dance wasn't enough just for me personally. I liked all of what was going on behind the scenes to make that happen. And that's quite healthy, I think, as well, because for a lot of dancers, it's such a demanding career. It doesn't allow you a lot of time to reflect, to think about what else you might do, what might come next. It's a relentless schedule of class and rehearsal and performance and again and again. So the fact that you had those other thoughts whirring away probably kept you sane in a very good way. Exactly. And also I think because I was so interested, I was very lucky to be in very different types of companies and inside those companies experience very different dance styles. And that sort of shaped the director artistically that I am and what I want to expose not only our artists, but also our public to London, obviously, is a very different city because they've seen so much. But let's say in Dresden, where I started, I really felt I needed to take our public on a journey outside of just classical or just modern, really have the dancers move through that spectrum in a sophisticated and pretty fluid way. And in Dresden, you did get a chance to play with spreadsheets, play with casting lists, play with all, all those good things. Fairly young as well, just in your 30s, to be your first artistic director appointment. And as you suggested there, the city were hoping to shift the nature 
of what was quite a traditional classical company into something that looked more widely. And of course, to do that, you had to let go 20-something dancers, 25, I think, which must have been, you know, hello, I'm your new director, you lot are all fired, must not be an easy thing to do. How, how did you find that? So I had been hired or I'd been asked to stage the Forsyth program with the company prior to being offered the job. So I'd been working with them all really intimately for three months. So I knew them very well. It wasn't like I just came in and said, oh, you know, and in fairness, I kept about half the company. I let half the company go. From the half that I let go, there were a lot of people that wanted to go because they didn't want to be in mixed repertoire company. And I just felt I needed to do that in order to be able to deliver the repertoire and that wide variety of diversity in the repertoire that I wanted. And I was quite happy I did that because right from the get-go, we could start. Obviously, this is not what you've asked me here, but in London, I've done very differently because I'm coming into a company that's so established and on such a wonderful level, I don't feel I need to build it from the ground up. I feel like I need to complement and enhance it and keep it going in a direction. So those were strategic sort of decisions I made based on the environment that I was in. From the beginning, you'd thought a lot about what being a director would involve. When you started the job, did it live up to that? Were there surprises that you really hadn't taken into account? I started when I was 36 years old and I was so energized and excited. I had been setting a lot of Forsyth ballets throughout the world and from some different choreographers and guest teaching. So I was very current in what was going on everywhere from the Mariinsky to Nacho to Sweden to wherever I was going at that time. You know, when you have that confidence, I mean, I was young and in some ways very naive I just didn't doubt myself and I went for it. And I thought I had everything figured out. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Obviously, reflecting back now at 53, I'm very different than I was at 36. And thankfully, I've had that experience before coming here. So I think I'm a very different director now than what I was then. I think then I felt pressure to have everything done yesterday. It had to happen now. Everything had to be perfect, everything in line. And I overmanaged everything. I learned to delegate. I learned to trust. I learned to collaborate more. And I learned to be patient and realize that Rome wasn't built in a day. That's another thing. If I look at ENB, I've signed a five-year contract. So my artistic vision is over five years. It's not only right now in this moment. And it's going to take time to get my kind of sensibilities and qualities and things that I believe in. You know, I basically didn't know any of the company here and the team. So it's really... It's interesting. In Dresden, I built that. I came in, I hired my team, and I hired the most of the company. So there were people I had an affinity with and an understanding previously. And here, I really was so grateful to have this year, last year, to come and observe and not make decisions, just really get to know people. And that's what I'm trying to do this season, too. Give the people who are here the opportunity to show themselves before I decide what I think I need to do. Is it difficult in your role to show doubt and to have more questions than answers? It sounds as if that's something that you're far more comfortable with now than you might have been in the past but I guess there's always the pressure to be the person who knows everything to be the person who sends down judgments from high I think where the world's going the kind of structure of the all-knowing oracle king or queen at the top of the pyramid that's just sort of actioning things and everyone's running around doing what they're told those days might still be in place in some places but they're very much ending and you need to think of more collective way of being the best you can be for the company so I'm so happy here to have 
wonderful expertise in every department and that's what we're utilizing. I know my strengths on the artistic side. I have a wonderful executive director, Patrick Harrison, a wonderful COO, Grace Chan, and all of our directors of our executive team are so competent. So it's a collaboration. It's a conversation. Yes, in the end, maybe I'm the one that says after I've been presented everything, well, let's try this, let's do this. But I'm also asking questions. And I don't think that makes you weaker. I think it actually makes you stronger because you need to listen. I think one thing I also learned is you never know it all. You're always learning. And I think if you're open to that, especially evolution, evolving with the times. I mean, where I started 17 years ago, I feel like we've had a hundred generation changes. It used to happen sort of every 10 years, I would notice, oh, wow, I'm with a very different group of dancers now at 18. But then in the past five years, it was like every two years. So I think we have to evolve and times have changed so much, which was acceptable even five years ago or 10 years ago, or it's completely changed. That is so interesting. And I'm sure you're right, because the young dancers now, they've been through the Me Too movement, they've been through Black Lives Matter, they've been through the pandemic. And all of those things have shifted people's expectations and the sort of voice that they might expect to have as a even a junior member of a company. Absolutely. You just take what even if I think what I went through, I was born in 1970, but like say in the 80s or the 90s, what I experienced and what shaped me and just this past decade, all that the world's been through and the younger generation even being for the first time locked at home basically and missing three years of their career, how they kept going. So I think... They speak a different language and you need to speak their language or you need to start to understand their language because if you just keep speaking your own language, they basically won't understand you at some point and then there'll be all this disconnect. I just feel like for me, our artists, everyone in this building, including the dancers, are first and foremost adults, responsible adults. Everyone should be treated like an adult, not a child and... In ballet, sometimes, historically, it's been sort of boys and girls, and you listen to exactly what, especially in classical, what your teachers told you, and every eyelash, the crown that that teacher wore, that girl's wearing, which is wonderful in the sense of passing on information. But I'm very much about the dancers coming to the studio ready to participate and having a voice and being part of the creative process, respectfully, because they've got their repetitors in front and it's not just they come in and do whatever they want but that there's a conversation and I think that's maybe the key is nowadays dancers won't just keep their mouth shut and do exactly what you tell them because you tell them to you have to sort of explain that well why because this 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 oh okay that's interesting and I suppose something similar in terms of putting a repertory together because as the director you have to be able to champion everything you put on stage to feel really passionate and convinced about it but equally I guess if you only make choices from within your taste it can also narrow things how on earth do you balance that one yeah it's just it's a huge question isn't it but I think you know the vision here is embracing tradition and forging innovation and striving for excellence in everything we do so it's very much our kind of respect to the pure classicism the narratives that people have grown up with and love and enjoy and maybe just refreshing them so giving them a bit more life a bit more momentum then finding new repertoire to dive into that's been created for your dancers, where you're completely reimagining the narrative, new composition. And then there's abstract one act works with different styles. So there's a big spectrum of what you've got to try and include. And if I think it's overwhelming to think in one season, you have to hit on everything. But that's why I'm saying if you have a vision over five, 10 years, that you really make sure that that rep for me is evolving and 
it's touching enough on those things consistently that you're not leaving one style for a year and coming back to it. That you're you're really challenging the dancers to go from what we did this season, a Balanchine two world premieres into Akram Khan's Giselle, now into Mary Skeeping's Giselle, into Nutcracker, a new Carmen and Swan Lake. It's really they're diving into such different worlds and I find that exciting and I also find it necessary for their evolution because I think the more that they dance, the better they'll become as an all-round dancer, the more styles that they are exposed to. And is that what you're looking for in a dancer, someone who can be comfortable across that range of styles rather than specialists who can do one or two of them but not necessarily the whole Absolutely. Spectrum? I think I'm looking for people who can pretty well move through that spectrum in a sophisticated way. Obviously, you're going to have certain dancers that might have more affinity to the classics, but then I want them to be able to also do the other repertoire on a pretty substantial level. You know, you you have, and also they'll have their own affinities to the styles that they maybe like more. But I guess what I'm saying is, traditionally, maybe you would have had companies where there was a small group of people that really did the modern things, and then they did sort of the extras and the classics, and you had the classic. And also, it was kind of looked upon that if they were doing the classics, they're somehow higher, because everyone else could do modern. But now we're realizing how sophisticated modern and contemporary repertoire is. Yeah, I'd like them to be able to move through that repertoire, the whole repertoire. We are sitting, we should say, beneath a huge and beautiful poster for your first programme as artistic director, which indeed had exactly that Balanchine and the premieres from Andrea Miller and David Dawson. So very much a statement of intent in in a rather impressive frame. You've lived outside Canada for longer than you lived inside the country. And I'm wondering, what does that do to your identity? We're talking about identity as a dancer, as a director. How do you define that identity of your own? <laughs> I've thought about that quite a bit. It's interesting, isn't it? Of course, I'm Canadian and I'm proud of my country. But when I'm at home, there's a familiar feeling with my family, but I don't feel familiar with Canada because I haven't lived there for so long. I noticed lots of things. Oh, you know, in Germany, we do it like this. Oh, but then I'm not German. I've lived in Germany for 17 years. I've lived in Holland for seven years, Spain for about four, Israel for about three, London now before two years and now back. So where am I? What am I? I don't know. I think I'm kind of, I definitely feel and I know you use that word differently here, but European, <laughs> I would include Eng- the UK <laughs> Welcome in to Europe. Welcome Brexit Britain. <laughs> as far as just geographically, I'm, I, mean, I mean, I feel an affinity. I started out in the UK in London as a young man and dancer. I'm very happy to come back here. I think it's been wonderful living in different countries and speaking different languages. I love learning different cultures. And, you know, I love everything about, new kind of adventure but it is nice to come home to a country where I can speak my language where I can really be understood and just as cosmopolitan and and wonderfully rich in so I mean I get so much inspiration in London I feel I would need 10 years to know London it's like you have I don't know, 20, 30 cities in one city, and they're all so unique. And you get out and think, oh, this is the place that I love. And then two minutes later, you're somewhere else going, oh, this is, <laughs> it's just amazing. So I think it, it gives, this city gives me a lot of inspiration. I'm very grateful at this point in my life to have this opportunity. I believe in timing. And I think there's a reason why I, I'm coming back here now. I 
have to say, I have been gazing in awe at the immaculate sculpture of your beard. The, the, <laughs> it's a shame this is a podcast because people cannot see <laughs> the precise wonder of it. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, this is a man who likes detail. This man has no time for the shambolic. This is, it's possible I'm reading a bit too much into my new science of beardology. But, <laughs> but is this true? I mean, I'm getting a sense of order. I'm getting a sense of certainty. I'm, I think I'm a, probably to my detriment. I need to be prepared. I can't just wing things and come in at the last minute. I'm trying to learn how to be a little calmer. <laughs> But I think I'm pretty, yeah, detailed. (laughs) (laughs) And I feel we've taken you quite quickly through this life journey of dance. Just to return you before we go to the Fontaine, if you could say something to those young dancers who you saw giving their, their all at the weekend as they prepare to start that same journey, what would it be? What would the words of advice be? I think it's similar to what I had when I was young, and I really didn't know how to do that. I remember someone saying to me, and it's what I said to them on stage, try to enjoy every minute when you're in it. And I'm I'm not just talking about when they're on stage. Time goes by so fast. And when you're young, you think you have acres of time, and you're always looking, oh, what am I going to do then? And where do I want to go then? I don't know. It's maybe my thing as well. I was always ahead of myself. And then it's over. My advice would be try to be really clear about what you want from this career and keep that right at the forefront because you're going to have disappointments and you're going to have positive experiences and you still have to see where you want to get to and keep going. Even if you get two steps backwards, you keep there. Focus on it. In my life, I've been maybe lucky, but Whenever I wanted something, I see it. And even if I don't know how I'm going to get there, I remember being in Madrid and doing endless guesting, setting productions, which were exciting. But I thought, I really want to be a director. How am I ever going to be a director? Who's going to come knocking at my door? I still knew inside that I was going to be. I know that sounds maybe a little conceited or something, but it was like, I just absolutely believed I would be and it happened and also with ENB very interesting when it came up I was quite surprised because I wasn't expecting ENB to be looking for a director and I knew so many people were applying but I just knew inside me that if I would really go for this I went for it a hundred percent I didn't go for it thinking maybe or not and it worked out So I think for these young dancers to get back, just keep clear where you want to go and keep working towards that goal. So we've talked about beards, we've talked about destiny, there's almost (laughs) nothing else. So I will ask the final question, which is, Aaron, why does dance matter to you? I was thinking about this. I mean, it's almost like it matters so much that you've never had to articulate why it matters. But I think if you look back just to organically, even in primal times as human beings, what movement and dance represented, it's such a genuine and easy way to communicate with people. And if you look at cultural sort of identities, there's always dance that represents that culture. So I think for me, it's a way to engage with people profoundly on emotional levels and people don't need to really know anything about it. I believe if someone comes into a theater with no experience of dance, they should be impacted in some way. They should feel the energy of those artists coming on off the stage, transporting you out of your reality, even if it's just a few minutes, because, you know, in the past theaters were our movie cinemas. It was where you went to escape. And so I think dance matters in so many ways for health, or if you say physical and mental well-being, I mean, what better way move your body to music? And you even think, 
why young people always are going to clubs and dancing and then you kind of grow out of that and you go to the theater. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> that there is a moment in your life, why are people going out and letting go and moving their bodies to music? And one of my colleagues from Frankfurt, she uses dance therapy with children who are you know, having different issues to really help them. And if you look at our engagement programs, which I'm really amazed with how much ENB does besides the performances we're delivering. We have a whole other world of engagement. And Your our, Parkinson's that, program is amazing. That's what I was just going to say. I mean, Dancers for Parkinson's, Mindful Movers with Dementia. I haven't actually experienced it here, but I've spoken to Fleur, our director, and seen videos also. And even outside of EMB, seeing how people respond to music. They're very, very compromised in every way. And as soon as the music comes on, it's tapping into something else in our DNA that's just allowing them to express themselves. So I think it's healing, it's emotional, it's joyful, it's everything you need to be a positive, happy person. And I really hope that we can get more people into the theater of ballet and dance because I think once they come in, they might have a very different experience than what they were expecting that ballet should be. Do you know what I mean? That's because we need to inspire the younger generation to come in and keep dance, our art form, moving forward. I have never quizzed a guest about their facial hair before. I now realise it's the key to their soul, so it will be standard from now on. Thanks to Aaron for endearing that line of tonsorial questioning and for illuminating the delicate choices he must make as a director and as a judge for The Fontaine. The gold medalist at The Fontaine in 2023, Jacob Weiwei Hughes, is also a guest this season. Our show notes will link you to English National Ballet's upcoming shows, The Nutcracker, Giselle, Carmen, and to The Fontaine. Do subscribe, like, or review the podcast so that more people can hear beard-related dance chat. Our guest today was Aaron S. Watkin. Why Dance Matters is made by the RAD team of Neve Carey Furness, Keisha Dodd, and Katie Hagen. And our artwork is by Bex Glendinning. And our producer, Sarah Miles, she may not have a beard, but her nail game is always super strong. I'm David Jays. Take care and see you soon.